early, bright and early, and being here at 8.30. Um, we did have a five minute buffer to let people trickle in. I think there's a couple more just getting their coffee. Uh, that's all right. Um, there's plenty of buffer here. Uh, but uh, today is going to be a little bit more faster paced and a little bit more challenging uh, than yesterday. Yesterday was uh, a little bit more of a warm up for your modules. Um, so you're going to be doing a little bit more advanced stuff. And like yesterday, if you, if you uh, find your green post-it and your pink post-it, and as you work through the modules, um, when, when you're at an exercise, you finish your exercise, put the green post-it, you need help from a TA, do the pink post-it. Um, that just helps find people. Uh, and if nobody's found your post-it, just raise your hand. Okay? You can get more post-its if you lost your post-its. Uh, that's not a problem. All right, um, so without further ado, uh, today's uh, mod first module is um, image subtraction, and uh, Dr. Christopher Fremling is going to be giving the lecture. Um, so when Christopher came to Caltech, um, he was given the task of taking any image from any, from a telescope with any other image from any other telescope, subtracting it and getting good photometry. And this was considered a more or less impossible task a few years ago. Um, but Christopher solved that problem, um, so he's going to sh uh, share some of the secret sauce on how to do this, and it's extremely useful because many times you're getting follow-up data from a telescope which doesn't have a reference image, um, so it's really cool to be able to you know, subtract them and get reliable photometry um, in minutes instead of waiting for the transient to fade away and then getting a reference image and then doing subtraction. So this is a pretty handy trick to have in your toolbox. Pay attention. All right. Okay, thank you, Mansi, for the introduction. So just uh, to repeat, my name is Christopher. I'm a postdoc at Caltech. We'll be talking about image subtraction. Uh, and first of all, I'm going to try to convince you why this is ac actually a worthwhile thing to do. Right? Why do we need this? Uh, as an illustrative example, uh, just uh, showing uh, how this used to be done, or basically how we used to do transient detection for quite a long time. Uh, this is an image from an amateur astronomer, Stu Parker. Uh, he's in Australia, I think. Uh, and what he's doing, uh, kind of in line with what we used to be doing as professionals. Uh, so this is one image. Uh, this is the image he got the next day. Uh, and there is a supernova, actually, a transient source in this image that wasn't in this one. Uh, can somebody actually see where it is? Yeah, so it's actually right next to this center of this galaxy. Uh, so he's doing this by eye, by just comparing images from one night to the next, and then announcing this supernova. So this one he actually announced. He was the first guy to announce this one. So it's a type 2 supernova. Uh, right. So. That's the first thing. Uh, uh, I will show you why it's going to be much easier to detect these guys if you do image subtraction. Uh, as an example of that, uh, I'm showing here uh, one uh, quadrant uh, of a ZTF 48-inch uh, uh, exposure. So on the Fricky Transient Facility, which is the largest uh, transient survey right now. Uh, we have actually have 64 of these things in one exposure. Okay, so uh, down what? here uh, there is a supernova. This is a zoom in. Uh, this is the image that actually has the supernova. Can anybody tell where it is now? Probably not. So this is when you subtract the reference image, which was this, uh, from this. Now it's pretty clear. Here is supernova. And remember, you know, this was only this tiny fraction here. There is no way you can, uh, by eye, look at 64 of these guys and try to figure out where are the supernova. Okay. So this is really, this is the main reason why you have to do image subtraction uh, in uh, today's climate. Uh, if you're running any kind of survey, this is what you're going to have to do. Okay. 
right but it's not the only only thing uh, you can do with this uh, so I have one more nice example as to why it's very important this is a galaxy uh, that hosted supernova 2014J uh, you can see it's a, it's a very nearby galaxy it has lots of uh, flux uh, this is just adjusting the scaling here is where this supernova happened well, it should be pretty clear that the galaxy and the supernova, they are kind of similar in brightness. Uh, so if you would try, uh, you know, this is how it looks with just the default scaling. If you would try the aperture photometry you learned yesterday, it's not going to work for you, okay? Uh, so you have to get rid of this galaxy to actually something like uh, this, which is what you want to see in your papers. So this is just one example. Uh, of uh, supernova two, actually two different supernova with uh, subtract host subtracted photometry. Uh, so I put this example because in this paper, you can actually find an image subtraction pipeline uh, that we have been using in lots of papers. So if you want the details, look at this paper. Okay. Uh, so how do you do this in practice? Uh, you need a reference image without your transient. You need to take new science images, then you just subtract the reference image and find any transients you might have or do your whatever photometry you want to do. Uh, the thing is, uh, ideally you would like the reference image and the science image to come from the same telescope uh, using the same photometric filter. This is going to be, you know, mathematically perfect, more or less, when you do the subtraction. But you don't have to do it like this. It's quite possible to use a reference image from some other telescope. As long as the filters are close enough, uh, it's going to work. Or it, that it will at least work much than the photometry. Right. So this is where surveys like uh, PANSTARS, DSS, uh, energy survey, all, all these things can be very useful. You can grab their images and use them as references. Okay. So how is this done? Actually, uh, many of the steps are very similar to those that uh, Dan Pearly explained yesterday. Uh, it's just that uh, in this case, you cannot just do a rough version and should maybe shift your images by full pixels. This is not going to work. You're going to have to do it right. Otherwise, it won't look good. Okay. But the basic steps is image alignment. This uh, Dan talked about this. You have to match the positions of the stars in your reference and your science frame. Uh, put them on the same coordinate system, basically. Uh, then you have to match what's going on with the stars in the images, the point spread functions. They have to be very similar. Otherwise, you will see residuals all over the place. And you have to match the scales in both images. Basically, you want uh, the same flux uh, in the stars, so they actually disappear. Okay. This is also where catalogs can be very useful. I will get back to that. Uh, finally, you just do the subtraction. Uh, so there is one more step. That, uh, it's not necessarily a part of this, but it's very important. That's why I put a zero here you need to have done a proper background subtraction of the sky background. Otherwise, this, you will see very strange looking residuals. And you cannot just, uh, or typically you cannot just subtract a constant median or whatever. This is not going to work. You're going to have to fit some kind of function to the background. And to successfully do that, you're going to have to mask out the stars. You're going to have to do iterations, all kinds of things. I think this will be covered in the notebook later okay so the first step uh, image alignment uh, you already kind of saw this but basically you have to figure out uh, in your reference and your science frame what are the common point sources stars uh, which one are actually in both or which ones are in both images so you can use them to figure out uh, what is the, act, the geometric mapping you need to turn one image into the other in terms of coordinates. Uh, simplest case would be 
you just have a shift in the x, y. So you, uh, that's what you saw yesterday. So you can just shift one image in x and y. Uh, but generally, this is not good enough. It's not going to work. Uh, you actually have to fit something more general. And when you, fig you have figured out your geometric mapping, you just apply the transformation to the image. There are many, many ways to do that in Python, MATLAB, IDL, whatever. IRAF, if you are desperate. Okay. Uh, this is just to illustrate this step. So these are images. Uh, I tried to uh, cut them at the same x, y coordinates. Okay. Uh, they, they are two different uh, images for, of uh, some supernova. Uh, these are the stars in one image. And then I put these circles on the same position in the other image. Clearly, they are not on top of any stars. So you have to figure out what are the common stars. You can do this using catalogs, or you can do it manually uh, by feeding in uh, what are the matching stars, the x, y positions in both images. Then you solve for the geometric transformation you need. In this case, it is actually a shift. Uh, but, so, I mean, it would go something like this. But this can be much more complicated. And this is where your basic uh, math uh, courses can actually come in handy. So if you remember, a uh, set of coordinates can be translated, scaled, rotated by using matrix operations. And uh, the best thing with this is that you can combine these things however many you want. Uh, so uh, you can see, of course, the more of these you combine, the more parameters you're going to have to figure out. But in an image, if you have 100, 200 common stars, this is not going to be too much of a problem. Uh, you can even fit for a year with different polynomials in NY, for example, if you really want to have to transform it a lot. Uh, that's the basic idea. Then when you figure that out, you just apply it. Uh, and the important step with this, when you actually apply that thing, you're going to need sub-pixel accuracy. It's not going to work to shift with full pixels, uh, which is kind of a programming problem, I guess. Uh, so here I actually have a question. Does anybody have any idea how could you shift one image in the computer by half a pixel? Depends on the image. Which means... Means uh, we calculate the of Yes, that is one way. Uh, so basically, you assume some interpolation function. Uh, you figure out what would be the value between the pixels, and then you create a new image. But there is one even simpler way. Uh, you increase every pixel in your image uh, by two. So now the, the new image has four, four pixels in, instead of one. Then you shift it by a full pixel, and then you decrease it back. Very simple. Uh, you could. It's going to be hard if you do something other than just a shift. Uh, but in theory, that's basically what is happening when you use uh, different functions in Python, MATLAB, whatever. OK. Right, the next step, uh, you have to match the point spread functions in your images. Uh, so the point spread function is basically how the star, how a star, if you know you're looking at a star, how does it look? Uh, and to illustrate this, I have made actually this thing. So <clears throat> if you were in space, uh, a star would be just a point. Uh, so this could be one uh, observation. This is another observation. They, they would look exactly the same every time from space, in theory. Okay. Uh, but we're looking from Earth, and let's say your science image looks like this. Then you know this is the point spread function of that. Your reference looked like this, maybe. Uh, so how can you make these two to actually match each other? It's very simple. You just apply this one on the that one, this one, and this one. Fortunately, operations like these, uh, convolutions, permute. You end up exactly the same thing. 
That's it. This is the simplest way to do this. Uh, it's not the only way, but I think it's the easiest one to understand. So you just figure out, you measure the PSF of reference science frame and you cross convolve them. Then they must be the same. And there is no error here, as long as you have sampled your PSF properly. This is exactly correct. Okay. Uh, so, of course, to actually do that, you have to construct a model of the PSF in each image. Uh, simplest way to do that, you just figure out what, which are stars, which you, you learned about yesterday, how to do that. You stack all the stars on top of each other and do a median. Or you can assume you know something about how this uh, PSF behaves in terms of uh, some analytical or many functions typically, and fit that to maybe the median or to each individual star and kind of figure, try to figure it out. Uh, when you have that, you apply the convolution, like I said. Um, but there are other ways. See if I am, yeah. You could, instead of doing this cross thing, which gives kind of a very big uh, final PSF, because you, you, you convolve two PSFs with each, with each other, uh, which is always correct, but you may want to try to not have such a large PSF in the end. And it is also possible to figure out uh, what uh, PSF do I have to convolve with this to turn it into this, the bigger one. And this, uh, to do that, you have to go take them into Fourier space, divide them. That's basically it. Uh, but when you go to Fourier space, you run always run a risk to see strange looking artifacts when you do divisions, multiplications. Uh, and you can even do that step uh, as some optimization problem, which is done by these guys in 1998, Alad Lupton. If you're really interested in this, read this paper. So they basically assume some set of uh, analytical models to model the PSF, and then they solve how much you need of each one to actually turn one image into the other. And this can uh, give uh, very nice looking subtractions uh, that have a smaller PSF in the final result compared to this. Okay. Uh, right. So the final step you're gonna have to do is you, you have to figure out uh, what you need to do to your images to make the stars match in terms of flux, total flux. And that we actually did yesterday. Uh, easiest way, you use PanStars1, SDSS, you measure the zero point in both images, then you just scale one until the zero point is the same as in the other. Then you can do your subtraction. All right. This is just a final example of what you can expect to be able to do. This is one science frame. I subtract some reference, and this is the result. You can see the galaxy totally goes away, or almost totally. Usually, or I, I should say, you shouldn't be too afraid if you're seeing some residuals going on, especially on bright stars. There is actually no way to make them totally disappear. And that's... Uh, Basically, a consequence of how photons work. If you have lots of flux, you also have lots of uncertainty, you could say. And it's not going to be the same from one image to the other. All right. This went pretty quickly, so moving on to the Python <laughs> module. All right. Igor, go ahead. while I set up for the notebook? Yeah. Right. 